The race for the White House has been dominated in the early going by the subject of race. We'll take a look at the issue that could tip the scales on deciding who will become the Democratic presidential candidate. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. We're still a long way from the first presidential primary and knowing which Democrat will face Donald Trump next year. Today, billionaire Tom Steyer, a fierce critic of President Trump, announced his candidacy. But this week, we also had one of the many other candidates drop out. On Monday, Congressman Eric Swalwell ended his bid for the nomination after failing to gain traction. But he's not the only one with low numbers. Of the more than 20 candidates, only four are polling above 5%. In one poll, Senator Kamala Harris shot to second place after confronting the frontrunner, former Vice President Joe Biden, about his record on racism, civil rights and busing during the first debate. The second debate will be held at the end of the month. Well, to discuss the Democrat race, we welcome Hillary Shelton. He is the Washington Bureau Director for the NAACP. Also with us, Imani Cheers is an Associate Professor of Digital Storytelling at George Washington University. From New York, Amy Holmes is a political commentator and analyst. And also from New York, Michael Benjamin is an Associate Editorial Page Editor at the New York Post. Thank you to all of you for being with us. Hillary, let me start with you. Let's start with the debates. The Democratic frontrunner, Joe Biden, took a bit of a beating amid allegations of racism during that debate. He dropped in the polls after that debate uh, when he was questioned on his views about working with what were termed segregationist senators. Um, this past weekend, he apologized for that. Uh, let's listen to what he said. Now, was I wrong a few weeks ago to somehow give the impression to people that I was praising those men who I successfully opposed time and again? Well, yes, I was. I regret it. And I'm sorry for any of the pain or misconception they may have caused anybody. But should that misstep define 50 years of my record for fighting for civil rights, racial justice in this country? I hope not. I don't think so. That just isn't an honest assessment of my record. So, Hillary, there's the apology there, but question is, did it damage him? I think so, in many ways it did. Um, I, I know Joe Biden's record very, very well from the years that he served in the U.S. Senate and even the work he'd done in Delaware prior to that. And certainly the issues he's talking about, some of them have to be put into a proper context as we talk about his willingness to work with whoever he needed to to get the agenda addressed, to get the job done along those lines. But I think the issue that hurt him the most, quite frankly, was when Kamala Harris raised the issue of busing in a very different context. One of the things he did carry in Congress that was deeply disturbing to, I think, many was the provision that actually disallowed federal funding to be utilized for busing if it's for the primary purposes of integration. That's the issue I think they carry today. I think we all recognize that we have those that are elected from many different parts of the country. And for us to be able to get our jobs done, we've got to work with those who will work with us that will support the agenda moving forward. But I do think in the overall, it was hurtful. Imani, was uh, Joe Biden being a little bit disingenuous there? Because as Hillary pointed out, um, there's the issue of busting. He's made other controversial statements. His support for the crime bill, the omnibus crime bill in the 90s, his attitude towards Professor Anita Hill during those hearings for Clarence Thomas's confirmation to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, what do they tell us? I think it tells us, generally speaking, that um, Joe Biden has made a series um, of poor choices. That, yes, he's correct, over 50 years, um, and he tallies things up really well. But the fact of the matter is that with the crime bill, with, as you mentioned, the way in which he treated and really spearheaded the treatment of Anita Hill during those confirmation hearings, is that it's just problematic. I'm hearing a lot more apologies from Joe Biden now than I'm hearing plans and policies. So it's time to move forward. He has to reckon with his, with his record. But it's not coming across, at least to me, as genuine. Thing is, Imani, has there been a change from Joe Biden? Because his defenders will say, look, that was then. Of course. 
Absolutely, and he, he, he rides black adjacent, as I like to call it, very, very well. He, he touts the fact that, of course, he was, you know, vice president to Barack Obama and, and, and their relationship and, and the things that he's done. And even if you look at who, who is staffing his campaign, he's surrounded himself with young, vibrant, energetic, incredibly brilliant African Americans. Um, but the reality is you can't just be black adjacent and not actually have the plans and policies that are going to move this country back on track to where we unfortunately have fallen so far from. So he's going right now with, with the apology tour, and I would really prefer him have conversations about what do you intend to do? We know what you supported as vice president, but what are your plans if having the opportunity to take that presidential seat? All right, let me go to New York to Amy Holmes. And Amy, still a long way to go to the election, uh, but the current polling shows that Biden is among one of two or three uh, Democrat candidates who can beat President Trump in the election. How do Republicans, and particularly President Trump, see this Democratic lineup? Well, I can reveal to you tonight on air that I have it on very good authority that President Trump has already invented a new nickname for Senator Kamala Harris. He's just waiting for the moment to unveil it. But I want to go back to Amani's point about uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. And in politics, when you're explaining, you're losing. And Kamala Harris was able to get the best of Joe Biden. I don't think so much on substance, but on style. That creak that Sleepy Joe can all be can now be called Creaky Joe. He was not prepared. He was not prepared for those attacks. And if he's not prepared for Kamala Kamala Harris, will he be, pre be prepared for President Trump? Meanwhile, a lot of voters who were, didn't know Kamala Harris uh, were giving her a first-time look. They saw a candidate who was strong, who was willing to take the fight directly to her opponent. And we saw that the night of that debate, in 24 hours, she raised $2 million. She's now outpacing Joe Biden in endorsements from the Congressional Black uh, Caucus on Capitol Hill. So. I don't think it's so much about substance, as I say, but about style. And Democrats are really looking for a candidate who will be strong and be able to beat President Trump. And let me add one more little sort of personal detail. I was bused in Seattle under Seattle busing. I don't hold it against Joe Biden that he might have opposed it, what, 30 years ago? But what Joe Biden needs to do, as Imani was saying earlier, is talk about his plans <coughs> for the future. When he's apologizing, he's losing. Hillary, should we forgive and forget? I think we should never forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whether we decide to forgive is a whole different program right. and whatnot. But I do believe as we're talking about Joe Biden, we should look at his entire record, mm -hmm. which in many areas for the NAACP, the communities we serve, was very, very helpful. If you're looking at issues along the lines of reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, he was very helpful. If you look at some of the provisions in the, uni the Uniform Crime Bill, there were some major problems along those lines. It was an, an awful experience watching both political parties split hairs over who could, for, among other issues, execute the most people for the most reasons. There were a lot of problems in that bill that end up festering even worse as to the crack cocaine epidemic and how that end up relating to so many African Americans going into prison. And quite frankly, as we saw, so many additional Americans going into prison as well. Mm -hmm. So here's a big record. One of the challenges with being around for a while is that you have a record on so many different issues. But I think we need to look very carefully, think about the issues that are important to us, and I think also the signal we're getting is we have to look forward. What does this mean to what your plans and your vision are for the country? What does this mean for the <coughs> communities like the African-American community that you'll need to serve as well if you became president? All right, let me bring in Michael Benjamin. He's in New York as well. Uh, Michael, there's a word that we often hear when we talk about Democrat uh, candidates right now. We hear the word electability. Uh, there was pretty much uh, general consensus after those two debates that we saw that the party has moved to the left. Some may say too far to the left. And it's something that Joe Biden has been talking about. Let's listen to what he had to say. What I've seen around the country is the vast majority of Democrats are where I am on the issues. Mm -hmm. It's center left. That's where I am. Where it's not is way left. Now, look, but that's what we can find out. That's what this, that's what this debate is about. I guess, Michael, uh, many of the candidates on the Democratic side uh, will be seen as being too far left. But is Joe Biden right there that this country is going to vote someone who's more at the center? Yes, Joe's right. And he's, right now, he's on his heels because of the accusation involving the, the busing. But yeah, Joe's right. Most American voters, Democrats and Republicans, independents especially, are center left. Um, the party can't afford to go too far left. 
they need to remain focused on Donald Trump as the galvanizing, I guess, force for Democratic voters to come out and vote for whomever the Democratic candidate is. This constant sniping around who has the best policy or who did what 40 years ago, those things are, are distractions. Um, what's going to happen is that whoever has the best ground game for Iowa and Nevada and South Carolina will probably wind up being the, uh, the Democratic Party's uh, nominee. It's not about substance, it's not about style, but who has the best organization going forward and getting themselves out there and getting themselves the uh, necessary primary and caucus votes. And also, yeah. Michael, sorry, Amy, did you want to say something? No, I didn't. Oh, well, I just oh, wanted sorry. to kind yeah. of jump in on the, the busing issue when we were talking about policy. Mm -hmm. uh, David Axelrod, President Obama's, you know, campaign guru and strategist, he noted that Kamala Harris, she actually backpedaled after the debate, and she yeah. sort of uh, ended up taking Joe Biden's position. So even D David Axelrod said, what was that all about? What, was, what it was about was Kamala Harris putting herself on the map as someone who can take the battle to Donald Trump. Imani, go ahead. I, I have to respectfully just disagree that this isn't about policies moving forward. Um, yes, this notion that, you know, whoever is going to beat Donald Trump, but there are a lot of Americans and a lot of voters who are actually not interested in this reality show um, nightmare that we've been in, and people who, who made choices to either, A, sit out in 2016, um, who decided to vote a third party, or also who voted for for Donald Trump, realizing that now, two and a half, almost three years later, that was a really poor decision. So there are people who want policies. They want to know about their health care. They want to know about immigration and what we are going to do about crises in this country uh, with migrants and with these concentration camps that are on our borders. People care about policies. Yes, finesse. And Trump won with whatever finesse you might call that he had, but policies and plans, I do, I still believe, are very important to a wide majority of people in this country. I, I would yes, agree. But, but the path yeah. forward, but the path forward is not through free college. It's not through free college. It's not through relieving student debt. It, it's much more, much more widespread than that. The anxiety Americans feel for those who feel on, on the outside, it, it surrounds being able to work be able to create a, a, a pension, to have a future for themselves and then for their children and their grandchildren. And I think if they address that, the candidate who addresses that is the one who's most likely to wind up as the Democratic nominee. But, well, but student loans are also a major issue there. So like, I, I do believe that someone who's coming with and this whole far left, center left, <coughs> um, I mean, we have, a, we have a current person sitting in the White House who is extremely, in my humble opinion, far right. And, 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 the, and the policies and the things that he has embraced, the language that he uses um, to describe human beings fleeing and coming to this country looking for mercy and grace, um, I, that is incredibly far right uh, terminology. And we need someone, well, yes, student loans are drowning for people. A minute. So uh, hold on for a minute. Let me interject here. Interestingly enough, a brand new poll that just came out this week, uh, Washington Post, ABC News, finds that President Trump's approval rating is at 47 percent. It's actually one point higher than President Obama at the same point in his presidency. And as we know, the immigration issue was the rocket fuel mm -hmm. that propelled uh, President Trump in the Republican primary and then in the general. We're talking about the ground game. We're talking about the Electoral College, all those things. But uh, uh, how shall I put it? that the Democratic nominee has to kind of thread this needle. They have to get the left progressive for the primary, but when they go into the general, they cannot be pitching to the American people that they are going to be offering free college, free health care to, to illegal immigrants. Donald Trump is, I, I think, could be able to win on those issues. What the Democratic nominee needs to do is to be able to win on the number one issue that we saw in 2018 was right. health care. Imani, you mentioned that, but right now we're not hearing Democrats uh, proposing right. something that is reasonable, particularly when they're suggesting that illegal immigrants should get free health care by the taxpayer dollar. Hillary, I want to move on to the other big contender among the Democratic Party uh, candidates, and that's the former California Attorney General, former prosecutor, uh, Kamala Harris. She also has a controversial record. Uh, in fact, the New York Times ran an opinion piece some months ago with the headline, Kamala Harris is not a progressive prosecutor. It details what appears to be gross prosecutorial uh, malfeasance, overreach, disdain for the judicial process. Uh, and most of the victims were black or brown. Is that going to hurt her? Well, I, I think it is. I think people are going to reassess uh, her record as they look at these issues during the time she was prosecutor. What we have to look at in that context, however, is her new record. 
So mm -hmm. what she's like today. And what we'll see is if we look at the, exp the experiences that she's demonstrated as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, whether it's problematic and extremist judges, whether it's progressive policy around criminal justice concerns along those lines, whether we're talking about issues within how the criminal justice system functions now and the policies she wants to change, it's really the message going forward. Most people saw her sitting on that Judiciary Committee mantle raising the issues, challenging FAR, challenging the Attorney General of the United States, and challenging others on issues that are extremely important to the African American community and other communities around our country today. So that record's going to come forward, and we'll have to address those issues as well. But I think what she has now in terms of how she's viewed is the policy she's moving forward now to speak to addressing and, quite frankly, eliminating some of those policies she was in a position to have to defend uh, as a prosecutor in California. Imani, we look at the media today and it's rife with stories of bias in the criminal justice system. Is this going to be a big issue in this election? Absolutely. I mean, we are at a time where uh, this country is, is, is coming to terms with um, the way in which our, our, our law enforcement treats its citizens, um, regardless, um, but most importantly, about race um, and about gender. And these are the issues that are going to be very important. Similar to where we just discussed Joe Biden's history and his, and his Kamala or or um, Elizabeth Warren or anyone else going to be judged on their history? Absolutely. Um, whether or not that hinders their progress um, in this race, I think, is still to be seen. Uh, but Kamala has addressed, a, you know, a number of times her prosecutorial record. She was a prosecutor. That was that was her job, yeah. and that's what she did. And the community in which she was working in um, was a community with a large African American and Latino, mm -hmm. uh, you know, population. So she did her job. I'm not going to defend it or either which way. But she will have to as she has already, um, um, you know, answer the questions about, about her history. And we, she's done that. We are seeing changes, though, but at a local level. I Absolutely. Mean, we, we're seeing more progressive prosecutors and, and attorneys coming into office. Hopefully. We also see a lot of conservatives mm -hmm. coming into I think people tend to, with all the smoke and mirrors that happens in, again, this reality show of an administration, is that we see um, a number of federal circuit court judges who are, who are being, you know, bought into the system that are yeah. far, far right and, and incredibly staunchly conservative, and we're going to see how that, that's played out with um, women's reproductive rights. You know, we've seen that right. recently, uh, where women's reproductive rights from, from the state to, to the federal level is constantly being challenged as they try to take away um, those rights for women and close um, clinics that perform at a small percentage but perform abortions. Michael Benjamin, when it comes to the relationship uh, between the Democratic Party and people of color, there was an interesting comment made way back in 2017 by Charles Barkley, the uh, NBA Hall of Famer. Uh, he worked uh, on, on, the, uh, on behalf of a Democrat candidate at a U.S. Senate election in uh, Alabama. There was a shock <laughs> result. The Democrat won the election. And shortly after that, while they were in the midst of celebrations, this is what Charles Barkley had to say. Let's watch this. Well, this is a wake-up call for Democrats. They've taken the black vote and the poor vote for granted for a long time. It's time for them to get off their ass and start making life better for black folks and people who are poor. So, Michael, does Charles Barkley have a point there? Um, it's a canard by, you know, folks like Charles Barkley and others, definitely for, for Republicans, that the Democratic Party hasn't been taking care of its black voters. Um, when, when you look at the history of the last 50 years through the, uh, through the Great Society programs, uh, the jobs programs, the health care programs, a number of things that were beneficial to black and poor Americans were beneficial to the party. Um, so I really don't understand where this thought that the uh, party has not been reflective of African Americans. You know, the, the party did nominate and elect a African American biracial person as president of the United States. Um, Jimmy Carter had an African-American as the U.N. ambassador. A number of things have happened for African-Americans across this country for the last 50 years with and through uh, Democrats. Uh, Democrats in New York City elected the, first, the city's first African-American mayor. I mean, those things happened. The policies also are about helping people. Whether you're specifically saying this must be a, a black policy, that's not how we should govern in America. And that's the problem, I think, when you have all these candidates who are talking about uh, reparations for African-Americans. Well, maybe we should discuss that, have a commission, and also have a national commission mm -hmm. that looks at race and policing in America rather than having the federal government and the president trying to uh, create local policing policies instead of looking at, at what's happened. I mean, I think we need something similar to the uh, 1968 uh, Kerner Commission to come mm -hmm. back with a report about black 
Hispanics and others and the relationship with, with the police and how things can change for the better without the uh, federal government becoming a uh, micromanager of local law enforcement. Uh, Michael Benjamin, uh, Hillary raises the point of reparations. What's your view on that? We believe that certainly H.R. 40 should pass. There are H.R. 40 being? H.R. 40 is the uh, reparations bill that mm -hmm. calls for a commission to be created to study the impact right. of the transatlantic slave trade and other programs and policies that, that actually discriminated against African Americans and prevented us from fully participating yeah. in the overall society. We think it should pass. There is a number of, of elements you can point to mm -hmm. along the lines that can only be traced back to slavery and the, the, their very depth and and quite frankly, the context in which slavery was, was utilized to dehumanize a group of people. Then if we move through that to the black codes, if we talk about Jim Crow, we begin talking about many of the segregationist policies that prevented our participation, places that we could live, institutions that we could actually participate in, universities that we could t attend, and issues along those lines, it all traces back in so many ways. So we believe there should be that analysis that looks at these issues very seriously and significantly, and it's done by the federal government with the oversight of so many of us, we have a wonderful Congressional Black Caucus and others, yeah. the largest number of, of CBC members that are actually chairs of committees on Capitol Hill. There's a lot to be done. And quite frankly, this race commission, or this uh, reparations commission, would be a very, very helpful tool along those lines. Amy Holmes, there was a headline in the Washington Post. I mean, I heard your points you made about uh, immigration being front and center in this uh, election round, but there was a headline in the Washington Post said, uh, and I'm quoting here, Democrats are making 2020 all about race. And given the racist comments that President Trump has made, do you believe this could be a winning strategy for the Democrats, that is? I I, I don't think, actually, uh, making the election about race is a winning strategy. Uh, president Obama, when he first ran for president in 2008, he said, there's no black America, there's no white America, there's no red state, there's no blue state. He actually ran as a unity candidate. And as we saw, that was enormously appealing mm -hmm. and very successful. And he won with an over, you know, with the, uh, the majority of the voters who want to move our country forward. I think it's a real trap, actually, for the Democratic Party to focus on uh, uh, race racial division, racial resentments. I understand wanting to study reparations and what that could look like, what that means. But a lot of Americans look at this and say, so does that mean that a recent immigrant from, let's say, El Salvador or Guatemala should be paying reparations to Charles Barkley or Michael Jordan? Exactly how does this work? Should a new immigrant from Poland or China be paying reparations to any number of us on this panel who are making more money than they do right now? I see it as being very divisive and not a winning strategy for Democrats. The winning strategy is to have a message that brings us all together and how we're going to move our country forward. Interestingly enough, President Trump, with all of his very inflammatory rhetoric in 2016 about illegal immigration into the United States, actually got a higher percentage of the Hispanic vote than Mitt Romney in 2012. So these issues, I don't think, fall neatly along racial lines. A lot of people look at the economic impact on their lives, including African Americans, mm -hmm. who see immigration and illegal immigration competing away jobs that they would like to fill. So you want to say? No, I was just going to say that, that and in some ways I agree, in some ways I don't. Uh, in, in many ways, as we, if we don't talk about these issues, yet again, we're setting aside a, a demographic of people in the United States that have very well been left out too many times before. But I do agree that that can't be the only fix. That's not the only issue we have to address. As we think about the patchwork that makes up not only our country, but certainly the Democratic Party, we're thinking about many, many issues, including the continued impact on African Americans. As we look at the data, still being the lowest paid, still being the highest unemployed, still being the fewest to graduate from colleges and universities, still having many obstacles and problems and challenges before us as we participate in this great democratic process we call the yeah. United States of America. It all needs to be part of the overall landscape. Money, getting back but to the other that. conundrum. Yeah, so, so go ahead, Money. I want to say the other, the other conundrum that African Americans and others face is that African American employment has been going up under uh, President Trump, and, and he's been trumpeting that. Same with Hispanic employment. I think Democrats need to talk about, need to talk about immigration reform and not so much what the president is talking about, but coming in in January of 2020, of 2021 and coming up with an immigration plan that the Congress can pass and we could create a path to legalization for those who are illegal. And also talk about legal immigration and how do we deal with those folks who are here, as well as addressing the concerns of uh, you know, some African Americans who have concerns about illegal immigration. But we forget 
that immigration in America is not just folks coming from the South, coming from Mexico and Latin America. A great many immigrants are coming from Africa, West Africa, exactly. and the Caribbean, Asia, and, and uh, they too would like, would like, and Europe, and they too would like to share in the American prosperity. We need to create a real path of citizenship and, and immigration reform that makes it possible for folks who want to be here to then want to come and be here legally rather than, rather than sort of crashing our gates. I, I would only add that disaggregating the information is cruelly important, something that we've lost since the Obama administration. He mentioned employment, and the African Americans at this point have the lowest unemployment rate since the data's been collected, and that's true. But as we disaggregate just a little bit further, we see that our unemployment rate is still more than twice as high as any other ethnic group in the country, and certainly white Americans. Hey, Money, but that's what President Trump is going to take to the election, isn't he? He's going to say that the unemployment rate among uh, people of color has been at its lowest. He's going to, in fact, say the general unemployment rate has hit historic lows. Uh, the economy is doing well. Yeah. Stock markets are not run away. Well, I mean, the reality is that he's going to bring some factual information, and then, unfortunately, it's going to get muddled with exaggerations and with honestly outright lies. Um, and that's where things get, get troubling. And, and, and to, with my colleagues, on the one hand, I do agree uh, with all three of you in the conversation around reparations. But I'd like to also just kind of mention, because it gets left out, um, that at the end of slavery, slave owners were paid reparations. So this notion of reparations that now where people want to view it as like, oh, should we and who gets this and who gets what, um, I, have to, I have to agree with, with, with my colleague here that, that the reality is that there needs to be, whether it's a current commission or something, but we need to have the conversation. Uh, does it need to be a leading conversation um, with uh, this current um, group of 23 or 22, or however many there are at the moment? Um, maybe or maybe not. But I do believe it's something that we have to talk about race in this country. It's an issue. We can't keep pushing it under the rug or moving it around or saying that we're post-racial and this nonsense. And yes, because Barack Obama was elected twice, we've moved, you know, so far from the challenges. And, and, and the reality is that we haven't. The reality is that this country, we have, there are our, our Klan rallies in this city. There was one this weekend in Washington, D.C. There was recruitment over the weekend for the local Ku Klux Klan um, chapter. Right. So on the one hand, where it's like, oh, we're, we've moved past a lot of things. Let's not talk about it. I agree with Amy. It doesn't need to be the number one thing. I, yeah. I don't think it needs to be number one. Yeah. But it, it has to be in the conversation. And that's all I would like to but, see. But Amani, but Amani, okay. like, honestly. Very honestly, quickly, is there Amy, a I've got 10 seconds. single politician that would be backing a KKK march in Washington, D.C.? I would hope not. Yeah. Steve King and the Republican Party, he was told to get off committees and really not associate with, with Republicans anymore. Okay. I think what voters really want to see is what plans we have for the future yes, to bring, absolutely. to raise, that, you know, all right. uh, tides raise all boats. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. <laughs> We've run out of time. Thanks. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.